My name is Woody Chavis. I'm the police chief here in Kannapolis, and I want to welcome all of you to the Laureate Center. This is our city hall and police headquarters, and we're very proud of it. We'd only been in here about two years. And I was very happy when Keith uh, Cook asked if we would host the event because I'm uh, very honored for us to be able to host a, this event here. I'm also honored to stand here before you and just be a small part of these festivities. This is a wonderful event, and I know that everyone is very happy to be here. First of all, I'd like to thank all of the first responders, the firefighters, the police officers, the Cabarrus County EMS, and all medical personnel for the great job that they all do every day on a daily basis. We sometimes forget the job that they do. We forget about what they're doing out there, putting their self at risk. And I'm not talking just about police officers, I'm talking about all first responders because they all put themselves at risk. There's a lot of heroes here tonight that need to be honored and there's lots of reunions that need to be taken care of. So without further delay, I'd like to present a good friend of mine and a longtime colleague, Cabarrus County EMS Director, Alan Thompson. I'd like to open tonight with prayer, if you would join me in prayer, and also in a moment of silence as we remember those affected by the tragedies in Florida this week. Let us come together in heartfelt prayer and in shared minds tonight. We come humbly into this place with thankful hearts, thankful for those that are gathered here, thankful for those that have made it their life calling to help others through the art of medicine, thankful for their families and their friends who have stood by them, and thankful for the opportunity to live another day. We know that life, no matter what we plan, is full of surprises. And unfortunately, this unexpected, life-changing medical emergencies, well, we're never ready for those. But tonight, we celebrate life, we celebrate a second chance, and we celebrate those who have made a difference in the midst of the darkness and uncertainties that we experience. Our faith points us to a light that provides hope, and tonight we come together praying that we would be blessed and that we would be reminded of the things that are important in our lives, our family, and our faith. Tonight we pray blessings and protection upon those that continue to serve the community through the art of medicine and public service, and tonight we pray for those that have another day and we continue to offer thanks for them and the stories that they tell. Amen. I would invite you to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. It is my great pleasure to stand here tonight welcoming each of you to this special event. I share the sentiments of Chief uh, Woody Chavis and thank the thanks that we offer for those that are part of the public safety team, the first responders, the fire departments, the EMS, the uh, hospital community, the communicators, all of those that make this night possible. Today we come together, this night we come together and we talk about life. We talk about the chances that we've had and the chances that we will have. We celebrate as family. We celebrate as care team members. We celebrate as community of public servants. Uh, and we come together to celebrate this with the patients, those that are at the center of the attention that we provide. We're thankful tonight for the doctors, the nurses, the paramedics, the EMTs, the first responders, the firefighters, uh, the police departments, the telecommunicators, and everyone else that makes this possible. Because what we have here is a system of care, a community of care. There's no attention on one discipline, but all the disciplines come together with one focus, and that focus is each individual patient. It's not about a number. You'll hear some numbers shared tonight. That's what we look at uh, and, and how we are performing against national standards. But our true measure that we look at is those lives that are saved, the people that are sitting here tonight that are celebrating another day. So our attention in this community 
uh, is patient-centered, a patient-centered focus uh, that each person would have that best chance. Tonight, we come together celebrating the values of this county, family, faith, collaboration, and tradition, because all these together make these outcomes possible in a place where a system works together without concern for who receives the credit, a place where a system works together uh, with the focus on saving lives and making a difference. This program started in 2012, uh, and the numbers speak volumes. Tonight, uh, we celebrate 25 lives this year, and that's a big accomplishment. 25 lives, uh, those are human beings, somebody's parents, somebody's grandparents, somebody's children, and it's all because a community came together and cared. So to my next, I'm very fortunate to have the opportunity to introduce our medical director for Cabarrus County, Dr. Craig Corey. Dr. Craig Corey has been in this county since 1994 as medical director, served about nine years as a paramedic in Colorado, uh, served in the United States Army as a military physician, and has spent the rest of his career here and has offered his insight, his visionary values, visionary dreams uh, to a system of care and has charged this pre-hospital community, this public safety community, uh, with the concept of asking questions. How can we do better and how can we change? Just because we've always done it one way doesn't mean that we have to continue to do that. And in 2012, he championed a program that has resulted in the successes that we're seeing tonight. So I welcome Dr. Craig Corey. Well, thank you very much. Um, I am Dr. Craig Corey, and uh, it's been my honor to be here for 24 years. Um, it's also my distinct pleasure to be here tonight, and this is our sixth Hearths and Heroes, and this is pretty cool. Well, yesterday was Valentine's Day. If you forgot, it's too late. Um, <laughs> but we don't, and we, we feel that it's appropriate to cel celebrate Valentine's Day today because uh, your heart was in our hand. Um, you decided to test us, we did our job, and y'all are here. We have a system designed around the premise that if we can get to you fast enough in a sudden cardiac arrest situation anywhere in Cabarrus County, that we can save your life. Our whole system is designed for placement of equipment, communication skills. It's a very complex system, but it works every day to try to help everybody. The 911 communicator that y'all talked to when you called 911 uh, first gave instructions on how to do CPR. He then dispatched multiple pieces of equipment and personnel to wherever you are in Cabarrus County. Multiple first responders and paramedics came to your aid with the latest in equipment, up-to-date protocols, and training. One of the dramatic efforts of this approach is what we call the pit crew. And you'll notice that when this scene looks chaotic from the outside, when you stop and look, it's a choreographed dance. Everybody has a role. Everybody is doing their job. Nobody whines. Everybody does their thing. So we got you back. And then you started the journey through the hospital system. So the ER crew did their thing. You probably ended up in the intensive care. There was the uh, intensivists, there were the cardiologists, maybe the surgeons. Along the way, you were cared for by multiple nurses and techs, everybody dedicated to getting you back to health. And then they say you're better, and they send you home. And to me, that has to be one of the scariest moments, is going back to where you started, and your family looks at you, and you look at you in the mirror, and you go, what just happened? What if it happens again? Well, you got to know, we are there for you every day. It doesn't matter where you are in Cabarrus County, what time of day or night it is. You call us, we will be there. It's because of the Cabarrus County Commissioner's budgetary support. It's because of the support we get from Kannapolis, from Concord, from Harrisburg. All these systems provide money to make our system work. They provide for the latest in, equip in equipment and personnel. There are defibrillators on police and sheriff's cars. We have the up-to-date equipment for the fire department. We've taught multiple folks CPR in schools, the government, churches, and workplaces. And you may even see one of our community paramedics in your home. And all this is supported from a vast network, a vast network 
of financial support that's necessary for this to happen. So, as you can see, we are invested in providing quality cardiac care to you anywhere, anytime in Cabarrus County. And we appreciate y'all coming to this event to share your, your stories with us, giving us all a chance to be more than just numbers to each other. So, you are our Valentine gift. Thank you so much for sharing your stories of survival with us. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Chris Gaynor, who's a paramedic I've known for quite some time, who himself is a survivor and has some pretty cool stories. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Corey. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Corey, uh, Alan Thompson, uh, most of the administration, Jimmy and Justin, taking a chance on me to become a paramedic back in 2007, not knowing me from any other individual coming down here and guiding me on my career. Uh, you'll find out some of my cool stories here in a few minutes, um, but if, if it wasn't for the individuals at this table, I probably wouldn't be here where I was today, including this table over here. So why am I here? Again, my name is Chris Gaynor. Um, I am a paramedic, or I was a paramedic with Cabarrus County EMS um, for about 10 years. Uh, currently, I'm an instructor in an EMS program down in Charlotte at Central Piedmont Community College. But more than that, I'm also a, a father, a husband, and a son to my mother. So we're going to go back a few years, 1990. Now, that's the year that I got the public safety bug, so to speak. I just turned 16. I uh, wanted to become a volunteer firefighter, so I joined the local fire department up in a rural town uh, called Johnstown, Pennsylvania. It's about 60 miles east of uh, Pittsburgh. So while I was there, joined the fire department as a junior firefighter at 16, just like all other first responders, we were encouraged to become emergency medical technicians. Well, I was still a little bit too young, so I had to wait about a year. But in my senior year of high school, I decided that it was time. I would go to, my school, go to school during the afternoons, and then in the evenings, go to EMT school. So June of 1992 was whenever I graduated both and I became an EMT. So it was, I believe it was the fall of 1992. Um, I was volunteering with a local fire department. I was going to college at the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown with an undeclared major, just trying to find myself, see what I really wanted to do in life. So I was out with the fire department that day we were going out to pick out some lunch and we got dispatched for an unresponsive person at a local golf course. Now we, AEDs were really just becoming really prevalent for emergency services probably in the early 90s. So we had just purchased our, these for all of our response vehicles. So uh, me and the fire chief, we were about three or four minutes away from there. We responded, found that a 60-ish year old male had just finished his round of golf, was heading to the 19th hole for some food and to grab some beverages whenever he went unresponsive. Uh, on the golf cart. His friends fortunately had recognized this, lowered him to the ground and started CPR. So we arrived there, we continued CPR, placed AED on the patient, shocked him once, did CPR for another two or three minutes till the uh, paramedics arrived and we got a pulse back. For me that was a pretty awesome experience for a couple reasons. Um, it was my first save as an EMT. It was the first individual that I actually got to watch walk out of the hospital probably about two or three weeks later with very minor deficits. And the reason I brought up being a college student at that time was I was in an English Composition I course. And part of that course, I was required to do a daily journal. And in my daily journal for that day, leaving out, of course, all the specifics, just like I did here, don't want to have any HIPAA violations or anything, um, wrote about that. A couple weeks later, my English professor pulled me aside and she said, you know, hey, listen, I, I've read your other stuff and, and it's good, but I really read this and saw that you know, the compassion that you have and the enthusiasm for this save that you did for this individual's life. I know you said you're undeclared this time, but do you think maybe you have a career in medicine? Well, so I was like every other typical 18 year old, totally ignored her. Instead, I became a police officer. Uh, in the background, still was an EMT, still a volunteer firefighter, still kept doing the things uh, along those lines. But it also inspired me at that time to become a CPR instructor so that I could give back to the community, that I could see other individuals learning how to do CPR. So I started doing it with the police department I was in, I was doing it with the fire department, and I still continued to be an EMT. Now you know if 
you're involved in American Heart Association, CPR, about every five years we see some constant changes. Some of them are pretty minor, some of them are pretty major. But one of the, the biggest ones that we saw that came out most recently was hands-only CPR. And that's where we're actually teaching individuals who don't want to get involved because they don't want to put their mouth on somebody else's mouth that they don't know. Totally understand. Us as first responders, we don't want to do that either. We have the equipment to do that. So the American Heart Association, with their studies in evidence-based evidence medicine, said, listen, start compressions. Get those compressions early. Don't worry about the mouth-to-mouth. In fact, in 2014, the AHA had reported that 27 states had passed laws that required all high school students to complete a hands-only CPR course before graduation. And fortunately, North Carolina is one of them. And another study that I looked up in regards to this was a small town in 2015. They saw an increase of survival rates from 10% to 57% on out-of-hospital cardiac arrests because of hands-only CPR and early defibrillation. So I bring all that stuff up to let you know what it is like to be a first responder, to get out there and save people's lives, the individuals that are here today. But as Dr. Corey had alluded to, and something I left out of my introduction was, I too am a cardiac arrest survivor. It was October of 2007. I had just moved here in April. I spoke of that just a little bit ago. Um, I was hired on the non-emergency truck, uh, totally different division from the emergency side. So the individuals that I was working with that day, I really didn't know that well. They were just getting to know me. Um, a typical fall afternoon in North Carolina, beautiful, sunny day. Um, we never like to use the word quiet, but it was re relatively quiet that morning. Um, we worked in a station that had two crews where, because it was a rather, usually a rather busy station. So the other crew had just come back from a call and the four of us were sitting in the station doing what we normally do after a call, you know, whether we're getting something to eat, something to drink, discussing the calls that we uh, just ran or in the past couple days. And so some of this additional information that I'm going to give to you here is all going to be third party and can be corroborated by some other individuals. So if I quote you wrong, I apologize. But I was sitting in the chair in the mid-sentence, and that was it. That was the last thing I remember. So the individuals that were in the room with me that day, again, didn't know me very well. And from the conversations that we've had and joked about it afterwards, because you have to laugh about it, or else it'll drive me bonkers. Um, but one of them looked at the other and said, do you guys know if Chris has narcolepsy? <laughs> Just falls asleep like that? And proceeded to realize that I wasn't breathing, didn't have a pulse, lowered me to the ground, grabbed their equipment, started doing CPR, put the, the AD on me, recognized that I needed to shock and shock me, and did CPR from what they tell me for about two minutes. The next thing I remember is waking up on the floor of the station, or what I thought was the station, I really wasn't sure because I could hear what was going on around me, I could feel what was going on around me, and I heard voices that I knew weren't there when I went unresponsive. So, a little eerie, but for some reason I couldn't see. Didn't really know exactly what had happened. I had asked the crew, you know, did I have a seizure? Uh, yeah, sure, you had a seizure. Okay. Get in the back of the ambulance, and they're hanging a cardiac medication. I'm going, huh, I only had a seizure, huh? Yeah, you only had a seizure. Okay. Arrived to the hospital when I knew something was dr drastically wrong because my partner that I normally was partners with, Tammy Williams, was waiting there to greet me with my lovely wife, who had they called and brought her over from work. So I knew something just, something wasn't right. Um, so got me into the hospital, moved me over to the stretcher. Rita, curtains, they don't block sound. <laughs> so when I hear her reporting to the doctor, we shocked him once and he did, we did CPR for two minutes. I heard, quickly grabbed that curtain and said, excuse me, you did what? <laughs> I wasn't, didn't know anything that was going on at that time. But it was a life altering experience for, me, for myself and for my family. And that's why I'm here today. Because since then, I'd like to view myself as an, as an instructor, of course, and as a paramedic, but also an advocate. And the advocate that I, that I ask each and every one of you to do today, whether you are a survivor or you're a family member, is to be an advocate for the hands-only CPR, for an advocate to get AEDs placed in community buildings. Because the things that this crew did for me, now granted they are certified paramedics, they can do all kinds of fancy gadgets and tubes and IVs and medications, 
What they did for me that day was the same exact thing that each and every one of you can do when somebody goes unresponsive in front of you. If they don't have a pulse, they're not breathing effectively, start doing compressions, get an AD, and dial 911. It's all that needs to be done. And I'm sure some of the survivors that are here tonight, a friend, a family, or a loved one, or a bystander may have started that process. In your, uh, your program tonight, it shows you the chain of survival, and that's the first two links. Early recognition, dialing 911, compressions, and early defibrillation. So it wasn't anything fancy that they, that they did for me that day. I mean, it was, in my, in my opinion, of course, because I'm still here for that, but it's the same thing that each and every one of you here can do each and every day. So what I'd like to do is just talk to, to the survivors now that are here. I want to let you know that you need to rely on your family and your friends. Um, it's a tough situation. Something that I didn't mention yet that, yes, I, I too suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'm sure each and every one of you here that's a survivor, whether you realize it or not, you do. Because you'll find times in your, in your normal day where maybe you get a little dizzy and lightheaded and what's the first thing you do? I know the first thing I do is go, oh, well, here we go again. And I'm reaching for a pulse, making sure my pulse is normal. Or when I lay down at night, if I'm having a bad day or I just didn't feel right, am I going to wake up tomorrow morning? So rely on your family for support. Rely on your friends for support. If you're somebody that was like me, who I now have my own internal defibrillator, uh, thanks to Northeast Hospital and their cardiology department, they have a support group if you didn't know that. Reach out to the support group. They meet quarterly. They will help you get through this situation. You've gotten through the worst of it already. You're here today. But still, every single day, we have to live with what could have been. To the family members, thank you for being supportive of, your, uh, of the survivors. Remember, too, that they're going to have those bad days. So they may not even realize that they're suffering from those situations. So please just bear with them just a little bit more. And again, as I mentioned, every single one of you, please become an advocate for hands-only CPR and for AED use and having them in our communities. Now this is the part where when I was practicing I got a little choked up so I apologize ahead of time. Um, the biggest thing is of course cherish every moment that you have. Like Dr. Corey mentioned, tonight we had 25 survivors in Cabarrus uh, County over the past year. Uh, if you're one of them, cherish every waking moment. Um, because of the individuals that yes it was their job, but because they did what they did, I'm here today, I'm here to see my boys grow up, I'll get to see them get married, I'll get to see grandkids hopefully, not anytime soon. <laughs> and the best part for me is I get to wake up every day beside the love of my life and know that I'll get, to, I'll get an opportunity to grow old with her. So I've said this before and I'm going to say it again tonight, this is the 10 year, a little over a 10 year anniversary of my survival, so I want to thank Rita Barrier. Scott Hess and Blair Ritchie for your dedication to your craft, for your knowledge and for the treatment so that you gave to me to be able to be here each and every day. I wouldn't be here without you guys. And please just remember your responders. I know that's why we do this today is to unite, unite, reunite each other. Putting a face to the individual really makes our jobs more worthwhile each and every day. Thank you. Chris, if you will, come back up um, along with uh, your family as well as the folks that took care of you. And while you're making your way up here, you, you folks actually never had a photo opportunity, so you're going to get one tonight because <laughs> we have people here who are uh, some of the best photographers in Cabarrus County, and we're going to use that right now. So um, just so if y'all have moved down, actually, you're the first ones to have your picture made. So in the 10 years that have passed, uh, Blair is actually the director at Iredale County EMS. Scott is a leader in healthcare preparedness in Charlotte, and Rita works for uh, mobile intensive care or at, at the hospital now. So they've all moved on to different areas doing similar things, but we wanted to give them an opportunity tonight to have their picture made because they've never done that together. So when you call 911, the telecommunicator that answers the telephone knows exactly what to tell you. They are trained at their profession and their expertise is second to none. They give instructions over the phone about what to do to take care of, of whoever needs the help from the emergency. They're trained and we want to make sure tonight that we recognize their leadership and th their staff as well. When we show up, uh, typically first you'll have first responders. So tonight we have leaders from all of our first responder agencies here in the county here to be recognized. These are EMTs and some other certifications as well who are trained and who are passionate about the same things we are, and that is providing excellent patient care. 
So when they show up, they begin the care until we arrive. When our folks get there, obviously we take care of you in different ways with medications, cardiac monitors, all the things that need to take place, and then we transport you to the hospital. You probably know that if it were not for a progressive hospital who, had, uh, who has uh, people who work there who are passionate about patient care and passionate about taking care of their patients, you probably would not be sitting here with us today because as Dr. Corey said, your journey really just started when we breached the door of the ER. So to the ER physicians and nurses, to the patient reps, we have one here tonight, the representatives that take care, uh, elders here with us. It is a system of care and coordination. When you move upstairs to the ICU, potentially you're consulted with numerous other specialties and doctors. Um, there's rehab, cardiac rehab, uh, physical therapy to return you back to your home. So we want to make sure that we acknowledge all of those service lines, all of those systems of care tonight. And that's what we're going to do first and have some folks come up and we're going to give them a uh, certificate and a plaque from each of these agencies. So I'm gonna start with a few names here. And if you're from an agency and I call your name, just come up and line up. Kara has a, a plaque to give you and we'll just line up down that way. We'll start with the Kannapolis Fire Department and Chief Ernie Ayers. And if you'll just hold your applause to the end, I'm gonna call all these because we have a pretty long list. The Kannapolis Police Department, Chief Chavis. Concord Fire Department, Chief Ray Allen. Concord Police Department, Chief Gary Gasick. Cabarrus County Sheriff's Department and Communications Department, both Sheriff Brad Riley. Cabarrus County EMS, Director Alan Thompson. Cabarrus County Emergency Management from the Fire Marshal's Office, Stephen Langer. Mount Pleasant Fire Department, Chief Jerry Taylor. Coldwater Fire Department, Chief Brian McDonald. Rhymer Fire Department, Safety Officer Roy Gray. Allen Fire Department, Chief Randy Dozer. Midland Fire and Rescue, Chief Allen Burnett. Flow Store Fire Department Medical Captain Bill Highland. Enochville Fire Department Chief Jamie Steikleather. With Odell Fire Department Assistant Chief Jeff Luck. Charlotte Motor Speedway Track Services Manager Keith Cook. From CHS Northeast, now Atrium Health Administration, uh, Bill Hubbard. Get a plug in there for everybody. That <laughs> I work for the hospital as well. Yes, I do read my emails. So, <laughs> From the uh, CHS Northeast Emergency Department, uh, Katie Goss. And if any of the following service lines are here, CHS Patient Care Services from ICU, Rhonda Wright. From Patient Care Services at CHS Respiratory, Cardio and Pulmonary, Chad Harvey. And from CHS Patient Care Services, Cardiac Services, Amanda Thompson. While they continue to walk up, I'll venture to say that most of you probably had no idea. And each one of these organizations and service lines at the hospital has potentially hundreds of people uh, working alongside them to pull this thing off. So. Uh, it is without any hesitation that we want to congratulate all these folks for all the work that they've done over the past year as well to make our system work. So if you will, as soon as, are we missing one? Okay, very well. If you will, join me with, uh, for a round of applause for everybody here. Sometimes great ideas happen, and without visionary leadership, it, it's just that. It's a great idea, and it doesn't move forward any further. So there's a gentleman in the room who thinks is retiring on March 30, or excuse me, March 29th. However, we're not sure we're going to let him just yet. But we want to take just a special moment to, to uh, recognize our director, Alan Thompson, for being the visionary leader that made a bright idea come to fruition with his leadership and support. And yes, there are multiple folks who work with the CARES Committee, but Alan has been a leader uh, second to none to, for this organization since 2013 when he took over as director, and even prior to that in many other roles. Alan, come on up. 
We have a, um, a certificate, and I'll read this to you right quick. This says to Alan Thompson for your role in leadership in CARES, which is the Cardiac Arrest Resuscitation Enhancement Strategies, as well as Hearts and Heroes from 2012 to 2018. Thank you, Alan. This, would, um, this program, and Alan will not take any credit for it, I promise, and there are a ton of folks who have worked, but Alan has been instrumental in making um, this and many other things move forward. So we wanted to take a moment to recognize him because if we let him, this will be his last Hearts and Heroes ceremony unless he comes back to just visit with us, but it'll be his last one as our director. So thank you, Alan, for your years of service. If you will, turn your attention to the screen. I had one nitroglycerin left, and that's when I, I took that one and I didn't, it didn't help that much. So I was driving, so I drove down Rogers Lake Road and parked by uh, apartment complex. Cabarrus County, 911. What's the address of your emergency? Attention MS-51, chest pains, the 3900 block of Eureka Springs Road, 3900 Eureka Springs Road. We got to him, he was sitting in his car, um, we evaluated him really quickly. He said, I'm just, you know, my, my chest started hurting, I'm just not feeling right, so I pulled over and I called you guys. We put him back in the ambulance, we uh, did a 12 lead EKG really quick, and he was past everything in flying colors. So we decided we were just going to transport him anyway and he was fine with that. And we got about halfway. He yelled or screamed and he grabbed his jaw, and you kind of, kind of like this, and just kind of like did, almost did a cartwheel off my stretcher. And it, it caught me off guard because we were just talking. He stopped breathing, his heart stopped, he lost his pulse. Uh, he went into a complete cardiac arrest right there in front of me. And all of a sudden I heard the, the monitor go crazy and start beeping and, and alarming. And then I heard John say, Jackie, I need you to pull over. Stop the truck, stop the truck, stop the truck, get back here, I need help. And I pulled over, I jumped out of the driver's seat, I jumped in the back and just jumped right on his chest, started doing compressions. Well, I think we did CPR for a minute and a half to two minutes. It, it takes you know a little bit of time to get the, everything opened and on and, um, and we defibrillated him and he came out of it immediately. It was, Unbelievable. He was breathing on his own. He was actually um, talking on his own. Absolutely not aware of what happened, but he knew something happened because he was very frightened. Just as we got him back, the other ambulance showed up with the other fire engine. We had somebody jump in the front seat and start driving us down to the, to the hospital, emergency traffic. So I was missing two minutes of my life. I hear from the either the navigators or the coordinators of the hospital. They send me the paperwork, let me know about the patient. They generally try to talk to the patient beforehand and let them know that they'll be hearing from us. And then I go out after making contact with them, see them in their home. This is a service provided by the county with collaboration with Carolina's Healthcare Northeast. Our primary focus um, currently are patients who have been in the hospital and have been discharged uh, after having a stroke, after having a heart attack or cardiac arrest, um, respiratory issues, to go see those patients and prevent them from being readmitted to the hospital. We also take internal referrals. Uh, if a crew goes out and sees a patient who has unmet needs, uh, they can refer and we'll go out and try to figure out what they need to, uh, to help them out. So honestly, the sky's the limit. I remember sitting at the table with he and his wife. They were both in a good place. He works in the healthcare field, so there was a lot of understanding about what he was going through. It was a neat perspective to be able to talk to him about the actual cardiac arrest and his perception of it. And he remembered um, one of the people working on him. He, he's never going to forget that experience as far as her because that was his when you look up the first person you see and you connect with, and that was her. He's always in the back of my mind whenever I'm running a code, um, whenever you know a questionable call comes through on the, the EMS radio in the ER, it's, it's always in the back of my mind. All right, well, we, I, I got one. I can definitely save another one. It can happen. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> I get choked up because it's such a good thing. He's home. Because I know the outcome. So. <laughs> Since we've instituted uh, some new protocols, um, the pit crew approach to CPR, uh, rapid recognition, uh, chest compressions, and uh, early defibrillation, uh, we've seen the increase in um, 
possibilities of, of, of not only getting a pulse back, but people actually leaving the hospital and, and, and being able to return home to their families. Angels from God. You were absolutely angels. You were meant to be there for him. What you do is, is just miraculous. You just can never thank somebody enough. To be able to continue the care, to have been the first, the first people there with him when things started, along with the first responders as far as Cabrera CMS, and then to see him after and to be able to continue that. It just felt like a full circle to be able to see him after and then also make sure that he knew that he could connect with us if they needed anything, and um, he ended up doing really well. So Anne actually wrote this and wanted me to take credit, but I'm not going to do it. But she very eloquently summarized the impetus of this program, and that is the most beautiful thing about Hearts and Heroes is that it simplifies one of the most basic human needs, and that is love. Everyone has a heart, and everyone can be a hero. Tonight we're surrounded by a room full of heroes and the hearts that still beat because of several acts of love. Tonight we celebrate moments in which husbands, wives, parents, colleagues, passerby, medical staff, first responders, and all others walked into a moment and impacted a life. And we want to start tonight with Mr. Rosenberg and his family. And he told his story on the video. We, would, we could tell a similar story for everyone here, but obviously we would be here for a long time, but we felt like this one showcased the, from beginning to end what this program is all about. <clears throat> if y'all wanna scoot down to the picture area, we'll get the hang of this after about the ninth one, so <laughs> we have several more to go. This is time for them to obviously shake hands, give hugs and, and reconnect, as well as have a picture made and be recognized here tonight. I'd like to point out that on this slide, the hospital personnel are not listed, and that is not because uh, we don't want to recognize them. That is because if you can imagine how hard it is to track down paramedics and firefighters that take care of a patient, you can imagine the daunting task of figuring out how many hospital personnel touch a chart, take care of a patient, come in a room. If you are here and you took care of Mr. Rosenberg, please come up as well before the picture. If anybody's here uh, from the hospital who knows that, that we're involved in his care, so our next slide was January 2nd, 2017. We had Cabarrus County EMS personnel, Bryant Kaiser, Ryan Mayhew, and Hannah Shank, as well as Kannapolis Fire personnel, Jeremy Abernathy, Hugh Barnes, Daryl Lighthill, Mike McVeigh, John Revels, and David Weinkoff. Kannapolis Police, Brent Rowland, Chris Fisher, Arthur Reed, and Cabarrus County Telecommunicator, Jamie Blackwelder. On January 14th, we had a cardiac arrest. Cabarrus County EMS, Coldwater Volunteer Fire Department, Mount Pleasant Volunteer Fire Department, and Cabarrus County Sheriff's Office. On January 24th, cardiac arrest occurred. Personnel from Cabarrus County EMS, Concord Fire Department, and Concord Police Department. Bystander CPR made a very big difference here, so you've heard that several times tonight. There were folks there who started CPR on this um, victim um, and made a huge impact in their outcome. On February 1st, 2017, cardiac arrest with Cabarrus County EMS, Concord Fire, Concord Police, as well as Cabarrus County Telecommunications. On February 8th, 2017, Personnel from Cabarrus EMS, Concord Fire, Concord Police Department, as well as Cabarrus County Telecommunicator. March 11th, 2017, Cabarrus County EMS, Kannapolis Fire Department, Kannapolis Police, as well as Cabarrus County Sheriff's Office Telecommunicators. March 31st, this was all just Cabarrus County EMS personnel. On April 23rd, we got several fire departments involved here. Cabarrus County EMS, Coldwater Fire Department, Mount Mitchell Fire Department, Reimer Fire Department, as well as the Sheriff's Office and Telecommunications. May 30th, we have Cabarrus County EMS and Kannapolis Fire Department. And actually, this is one that is here, so um, if the Alyssa Nichols family is present, if you folks would come on up. And anybody who's on the slide here from Cabarrus County EMS, Melissa Phillips, Mark Presley, Brad Maloney, as well as Concord Fire, Shane Bullock, Randy Dozer, Jody Mills, David Schober, Concord Police, Matt Greer, Tracy Law, William McCain, Stephen Williams, and Caleb Jackson, and from uh, telecommunications, Michaela Lake. I will say that family uh, CPR and bystander CPR definitely played a role um, in the outcome of Alyssa. She was pulled from the pool and CPR was started by her family prior to our arrival.
<laughs> While they're taking the picture, I'll just point out the law enforcement um, involvement in many of our calls. You never know who's going to show up first. Sometimes they're right around the corner when a call goes out and they show up and start CPR. And in this situation, you see several of our brothers and sisters in blue. And just to point that out, that we never know who's going to be there to help us, but we sure are thankful when everybody shows up. Alyssa, if you're not too shy, will you raise your hand so everybody knows which one you are? <laughs> and I'll point out, too, for the survivors, some of you, this may be the first time that you've seen any of these folks since the day of your emergency. So. Although it takes just a little few moments, we want to make sure we give everybody time to truly have the reunion. That's why we're here tonight, so. <laughs> Our next survivor is here as well. Uh, this is Brian Howard. This cardiac arrest occurred at the Corning plant in Midland. Um, Brian is our survivor, and those who took care of him from Cabrera CMS are Christy Southworth and Woody Arthur. Midland Fire Department Chief Alan Burnett, Jason Cook, John Frame, Bruce Keller, Richard Mooney, and Brian Ward. And from Corning, Cindy Carter, Chris Castle, John Durr, Chris Alamo, Bob Weatherman, Devin Neely, Matthew Jordan, and Cindy Mackin. While they're getting lined up for their picture, I will point out one thing. We spent this week training all Cabarrus County, County government employees in CPR. And this right here is proof when you see the number of people from Corning who took action and helped Mr. Howard, why it's important to have that training in the workplace. And it truly does make a difference because when you know what to do and how to do it and act quickly, great things happen. So. Our next survivor is not here. This cardiac arrest occurred on June 23rd, 2017. Cabarrus County EMS personnel, Concord Fire, and Cabarrus County Sheriff's Department personnel that are listed on the screen. Our next one is here, uh, Miss Amy Thomas. Miss Thomas arrested uh, with e while EMS was on scene while she was experiencing chest pain and quickly regained a pulse after CPR and defibrillation. We have personnel from Cabrera CMS, Tim Creighton, Brad Maloney, and Tori Murdoch, who was a paramedic student at the time, along with Flow Store Fire Department personnel, Scott Bingler, Zachary McPeters, Evan Parker, Chris Schaefer, and Chris Vaughn. Any of you, as well as any hospital personnel, just come on up. Our next survivor is not here. This cardiac arrest occurred on August 3rd, 2017 with personnel from Caber CMS and Concord Fire. Our next cardiac arrest survivor is here, Ms. Elizabeth Webb. Ms. Webb's husband performed CPR on um, her prior to our arrival and a pulse was re regained. This was on August 13th of 2017. We have Caber CMS personnel, Doug Bickerstaff, as well as Joey Clof Andros. From Rhymer Fire Department, Richard Shu, Ralph Beck, Tabitha Beck, Donnie Gandy, Roy Gray, Connie Gross, and Justin Ritchie, and from Cabarrus County Telecommunications, Mark Fuller. Any of those folks, as well as any hospital personnel, please come up. Our next survivor is here as well, Ms. Amaya Alejandra. Amaya was the victim of a drowning at a local swimming pool, and we had personnel on August 17th who took care of her from Cabarrus County EMS, Brandon Bird and Katie Williams, Andrea LeClaire, Wendy Seyfrit, and Carla Brown. From Kannapolis Fire Department, Tracy Weinkoff, Shane Pethel, Chase Abernathy, Jonathan Corrier, Kevin Cox, Daniel Jenkins, Jonathan Jenkins, Brad Jordan, Tyler Carricker, Cody McSwain, Jer Jerry Morgan, Nate Powell, Travis Rector, Bruce Seaman, and Brian Smith. And from Kannapolis Police, Nick Korn, Joseph Galen, Ramsey Niemer, Gaspar Ruiz, Preston Shu, and Joseph Van Skever. And I know Elder's here as well. He's coming up. Elder is one of our um, patient advocates and representatives in the ER at CHS Northeast. He also uh, provides interpreting services for us. 
and does a phenomenal job in that role. And if you look at the number of firemen and the number of police officers here, a lot of times people want to know why we send so many fire trucks and police cars to stuff. Well, this is why. Um, right here, because it makes a difference. And we sure are glad to have the help on days when we need it. Our next cardiac arrest survivor is not here. This occurred on August 22, 2017, with personnel from Cabrera CMS, Allen Volunteer Fire Department, Cabrera County Sheriff's Office, as well as Cabrera County Telecommunications. Our next survivor is not here with us tonight either. This occurred on August 30th, 2017 with personnel from Cabrera CMS, Allen Volunteer Fire Department, and Cabrera County Telecommunications. Our next survivor is with us tonight, uh, Mr. Wayne Anderson. If you will come on up with your wife, I think is here with you. Uh, we were routed to assist Rowan County on this date, September 28th, for a witness cardiac arrest, and Mr. Anderson's wife did start CPR on him prior to our arrival. She's here with him tonight, along with family, as well as personnel from Cabrera CMS, Brandon Bird, Carla Brown, and Reed Martin, and Enigville Fire Department, Chris Hunt, Gary Barham, Cody Harrison, Stephen Tilley, Taylor Barnes, Ronnie Abernathy, Brittany Abernathy, Hannah Abernathy, Sam Steichleather, and Francis Mateo. I know she's here. And anybody from the hospital who uh, helped care for Mr. Anderson, please come up as well. Our next survivor is here with us tonight as well, Mr. Joshua Truax. If he'll come up along with any family you want to bring. Mr. Truax was running a race at Charlotte Motor Speedway when he collapsed during the race. Uh, bystanders as well as personnel from Charlotte Motor Speedway um, crew there initiated care initially. So we have Cabarrus County EMS personnel Dennis Bellage and Joey Clof Andros. From Concord Fire, Austin Fink, Brent Taylor, Laquan Arline, Rick Moody, and Gregory Rizak. From Charlotte Motor Speedway, Scott O'Laughlin, Robbie Fisher, Akash Patel, Tyler Carpenter, Todd Taylor, and Alex Caldwell. Folks work in many different areas in the community. Um, some of them work for us part-time and at the Speedway part-time. Firemen, they do many, many, the same thing at many different places. So sometimes you see different uniforms. Uh, you never know what role they're going to be in and what impact they're going to play. So we're very grateful for that. Our next survivor is here with us tonight. Mr. Yosu's son. Uh, this was on November 16th, 2017. Uh, he had returned from taking his usual walk with his wife uh, when they, he, they went inside and he became unresponsive. They both have a medical background. She was trained as a nurse and began CPR immediately and then called 911. And we have Caber CMS personnel, Carrie Mahaley, Aaron Bell, Tanya Honeycutt, and Mark Presley. From Kannapolis Fire, Shane Pethel and Chris Barbie. And from Odell Fire Department, Jason Starr, Seth Kern, Rick Gilliland, Brian Ordaz and Ben Hateman, as well as any personnel from the hospital who may be here. Please come join us up front. You begin to notice the common thread with most of these is bystander CPR. It seems like I've said that every time. And as Chris was talking about being an advocate, we cannot advocate enough for you to be trained in CPR. If you don't know CPR, these telecommunicators that you see up here are very good at walking you through the steps over the phone. But that is a huge link in the chain. So uh, as Chris was mentioning advocation, that is definitely one thing that we can do. So our next uh, survivor is here with us tonight, Mr. Charles King. Mr. King went into cardiac arrest before bed one night and his wife began CPR again prior to our arrival. So Mr. King, if you'll come up with your wife, anybody else you want to bring with you, we have personnel from Cabrera CMS, James Hoover, Scott Honeycutt, Tanya Honeycutt, and John Cooper. From Concord Fire, John Ferrante, Matthew Harefield, David Schober, and Mark Goodman. And from Concord Police, Daryl Hooper, Adam Bost, and Mason Missler. as well as any hospital personnel. And our last recognition for this evening is not with us either. This was on December the 16th, not with us tonight. December the 16th, 2017, we have personnel from Cabarrus County EMS, Concord Fire, as well as Cabarrus County Telecommunications. 
As we draw to a close tonight, I want to take one more moment to thank a few folks. Um, obviously, Kannapolis um, City for allowing us to have this event here. Uh, Kannapolis Police Department, Kannapolis City Hall. We normally have this at the hospital um, and they're doing some renovations where we normally have it. So we chose this venue and I think it worked out great for everybody. Um, most definitely want to thank the hospital. The food that you enjoyed this evening uh, was provided by Carolina's Healthcare Northeast. Um, we could not put this event on without them, nor would you be here without them. This is, again, a collaborative effort from all involved, and we just want to make sure that we, um, that we thank everybody for that. I mentioned that you would uh, receive a picture in the mail of, that was taken up here, so that will be provided for you, for the survivors as well. Um, that should be coming in the mail fairly soon. And then one last um, thanks is to our CARES committee. There are numerous folks in the room who work with this cardiac arrest committee throughout the year um, to make these systems work. If you are on the CARES committee, anybody that's here, and I know we got some in the lobby, but if you'll stand up, any, all the folks that are on the CARES committee and have done anything with CARES, I know we have some in here, so. Where y'all, where are you? You're already standing in the back, <laughs> waving. We thank you all for coming tonight. We will continue to be here for fellowship and reunions, um, so feel free to hang around and talk with us. Um, and as you go home tonight, please be safe on your trip home, and we thank you very much for coming.